welcome back to the second half of the Enchanted History of Fantasy Illustration Symposium, or welcome if this is your first part of the second half. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker. I would like to also just briefly thank uh, the Shepherd Dog Fund, Dr. Klein, Dr. Alan Klein Advisor, for making this symposium, symposium completely free to all of you. So thank you, Dr. Klein. So I feel like this next speaker doesn't really need an introduction, and I will I will point out that we do have the bios available at the at the table out um, near the entrance to the theater in case you did miss it. Um, but I do want to say um, he, we, we are really looking forward to hearing from Tony D. Terlizzi, who has been creating children's books for over 20 years, from picture books like The Spider and the Fly to chapter books like The Search for Wandla. Um, he has imbued his stories with rich imagination, and his title today is Never Abandon Imagination. Um, we're very excited to welcome him to the stage. Please uh, join me with a warm Flint welcome for Tony DiCilese. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Uh, Flint Institute for having me. Thank you to everybody for coming out. It's beautiful outside, and you decided to do this, just hang out in a dark room with a bunch of <laughs> nerdy artists. Um, you, this, I, this is actually not my first time. I've, I, I did a book tour uh, many years ago through all of Michigan, Traverse City, um, parts of Detroit, et cetera, and, and have been to Flint before. But it's so funny, I was thinking about, um, I was telling friends, oh, I'm my first public event since 2019. Oh, where are you going? Where are you going? Oh, you're, you must be excited. Where are you going? I'm going to Flint. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so, of course, inevitably, and, and get your eyes ready to roll, they would say, well, don't drink the water, right? Don't drink the water. And I thought, man, that sucks. That, but I got to tell you, I feel you, Flint, because I grew up in the drain trap of the United States, where all the lunatics live, South Florida. So I totally feel you. I don't live in Florida anymore, but I can tell you, I don't care what news channel you watch, at some point, one of the newscasters goes, and you're not gonna believe what happened in Florida today. And you're like, oh God, a man was riding an ostrich, throwing rocks at, you know, it's like, it's just lunacy. So. I love you, Flint. Thanks for having me here. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I, um, I'm, as, as Tracy mentioned, I am a children's book uh, author and illustrator. I have actually been um, illustrating now for, um, geez, 30 years, over 30 years. God, I don't know how that happened. And I have been making um, books for children for over 20 years. I've made all sorts of books, mostly books that I've uh, written or co-written with friends. I've done picture books. I've done chapter books. I've done silly books. I've done kind of sort of serious books. Um, but they've all been pieces of me put into uh, words and pictures on paper for children and, um, and the adults who surround them and take care of them. And as I was Thinking about this presentation today and this symposium that we're all intending, uh, attending, I was thinking about um, not just imagination, because certainly imagination is something that's had a uh, is a common thread through everything I've ever created, but fantasy in particular. And I, I, I hadn't really, <laughs> I hadn't really thought about how, why fantasy and 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 how fantasy is so. Um, so important to everything that I've done. So I actually, um, to be honest with you, I changed the entire presentation and I'm just gonna talk about <laughs> fantasy art and, um, and how, what fantasy art and, the, and fantasy itself actually means, what, is, what does it actually mean to me? And um, because, like I said, I, I've done so many books with imagination, and, and so many have fantasy in them. So I was thinking about, um, I'm, do, I'm doing double duty here. I have to do the scroll on my computer as well as the. I was thinking about the word fantasy, right? I, I bet 
if, if, if I was to ask everyone here what, what fantasy means, we'd probably get a lot of different um, answers, a lot of different definitions. And sure enough, when I looked the word up in the dictionary, there were like 20 definitions for the word fantasy. Like even Miriam and Webster, they couldn't figure out just exactly what fantasy meant. And that really, I thought, was amazing. So I found a couple definitions that I thought were really, really interesting. So here we go. We'll start with this part here. A fantastic start. <laughs> Look at him. He's, all, he's got a real fantastic start. Um, fantasy, the ability of imagining things, especially things that are impossible. I love that. And that totally describes me as a kid. So let's start there. I'm told, there it is. Oh, it's going to be a lot of embarrassing photos. So get ready. I'm just embracing them all. Um, I was told I um, have a penchant for arts from a very young age. I've been drawing. I've, I was the kid who colored in a coloring book all the time. I was the kid who drew on the walls of my bedroom and got in trouble for it and um, loved art, always loved art. My mom was an artist. She spent a lot of time uh, drawing and painting with me and my two siblings when we were very young, and that had an incredible impact um, on me, uh, obviously, as the old dude you see in, in front of you today. Um, I grew up, as I said, in South Florida during the 1970s and the early 80s, and I drew all kinds of stuff like a lot of other kids do in elementary school. In the 70s, I drew a lot of dinosaurs, Jim Gurney. I drew um, this movie that had just come out. I don't know if you guys have heard of it before. <laughs> Um, and I also um, drew fantasy creatures like this, this, this lovely dragon here and this strange little man. I don't know if he's holding a spear or getting a marshmallow to roast. I never, I'm not quite sure. Um, and also, the thing is, when I was doing these drawings, it wasn't just like, look at this picture. In, in, for me, it was always like a, a, a frame of animation or, or a still of, from a film because there was a whole story kind of spooling in my mind and I was just trying to capture this one little tiny moment of it. Uh, my mom tells me I made a lot of sound effects when I just <laughs> So I was, it was always um, more than just a moment. It was, it was a lot more than that. Um, so in elementary school, you know, did, who, who here likes to draw? Does anyone? Look at this. Look at all these hands. And, and you know, in elementary, if I, I, when I tour, normally I tour in, uh, for children's books, and I'm in uh, schools. So if I go to an elementary school and I go, who here likes to draw or who here has stories? Every hand, every kid's hand goes up. I wrote a story about a rocket and a, and a cat and a dog. And, right? Everybody's so excited. They can't wait to tell you their story. I drew a picture of a man on an ostrich in Florida. And then... <laughs> When I get to middle school, I go, who here likes to, who here likes to draw? About half the hands kind of go up, and they're like, yeah, yeah. When you get to high school, it's like three kids, like two art nerds and the one art person that's like, eh, no, no, I don't know, I don't know. And boy, I know exactly what that feels like. So let's fast forward a little bit to this is, yeah, how about that? Isn't that a gem? That's a real, yeah. My head was gigantic. My head was the same size it is now, but it was on like a little 90 pound, like this, like just, uh, <laughs> going to class. And my parents are like, you know, maybe if we put really big glasses on him, <laughs> his head will look smaller, but it made it worse. It just, now I, a dragonfly, I don't know what I look like. Um, I definitely was a late bloomer, and um, you know, I tried my best in middle school to fit in. And I mean, I tried. Um, well, let me see. Here we go. I tried sports. That didn't work out so great. I tried uh, South Florida, so everyone liked to swim. That also never really went as well as I saw it in my mind. And I don't know if anyone remembers the Presidential Fitness Award, but I, you know, I certainly have blocked it out of my memory. It has. <laughs> Absolutely left no scars at all. Um, did, I mean, did anyone here have fun? Who enjoyed middle school? Oh my God, I hate you so much. 
I got to know what the, the secret was of why you loved middle school. Um, and so I think about this photo. That is, by the way, the fakest smile I can possibly, there's no teeth involved, there's kind of a far away distant look, that is, is not a genuine I'm really happy smile, this is like, no one knows what it's like to be the sad man. Um, so the other thing that I was into because of South Florida was Boy Scouts, I loved um, the Boy Scouts, I loved camping, I loved nature, I loved being outdoors. Uh, that's me there with the glass. Yeah, see, look at that. Line up, ladies. Um, I loved bird watching. I loved going to the beach and collecting seashells. I loved uh, insects and small things. We talked about tiny things earlier, and that, um, that had a huge impact on me as well. I would often do copies of these drawings. This is a copy I did of John James Audubon, um, Ivory Build Woodpeckers. I also did drawings from my insect collection of all the dead insects that I'd collected, like these carrion beetles. Um, yeah, I don't know why people weren't into that. I don't know, I'm not quite sure what, what's wrong with that. So. Um, it was, um, it, was, it was tough. I was uh, a geek, I was a weirdo, I was a nerd, I was a four-eyed freak, I was bullied, I was insecure, and I was angry. But I couldn't express that. I didn't know how to express that. I didn't know how to deal with that until I found an escape hatch. And another. This was a good escape hatch, too. And I really love this escape hatch. Here's the thing. I didn't relate to the heroic knights or Conan the Barbarian or any of the heroes. I related to the dragon. I related to Gollum, to the monsters, the outcasts. That was me. But fantasy was fantastic. Ah, that's good. There's a, there's a line. They're very fantasy was fantastic. Um, no, duh. Um, the fantasy offered me an amazing escape hatch from reality. And boy, the 80s were a great time for fantasy. You didn't just have these books. You had films galore, all types of fantasy. Um, in being celebrated in cinema through the late 70s and the early 80s, into the late 80s, um, there were the rise of arcades and video, home video games like Dragon's Lair and Adventure. It was awesome. I didn't think it could get any better and more amazing than this, and then it did. products of your imagination. How amazing is that? I love that. Dungeons and Dragons changed my life because now I had the perfect escape hatch that was, it seemed like it had been created just for me because I could go and explore it. I could change the narrative. I could, I could, I could change the monsters. I could create characters that lived within this fantasy world. And best of all, I could do it with friends. There were other people who felt the same way, and I wasn't alone after all. That's pretty amazing. The social aspect of this game alone had a tremendous impact on 13-year-old Tony. So much so that um, over the summer of 1982, um, it inspired me uh, so much that I wanted to create my own um, monster manual, my own guide. So I started drawing on notebook paper these dragons and creatures and trolls, and I wrote all about them like I had in the, like I'd read in the nature books that I had collected, and I put it all together in this one um, notebook called Gondwanaland. 
a was a new realm in nature and science fiction combined. And um, it was just so cool. It was such an amazing escape hatch for me to be able to spend a summer um, in a whole other world of my own creation, something I had actually made. It was, it was the, the, the fantasy genre as a whole had served me so well, well during such a turbulent and crummy time in my life. It had offered a, a really a refuge from a very tough and cruel reality. And, um, and I loved escaping. And, um, and so I spent a whole summer making this book. Um, but like many kids, and I'm a father now, so I've seen this again firsthand, you become fickle. You change. You move on to other pastimes, other hobbies, other interests. And so I forgot about my escape hatch and that secret special place. No. I know. <laughs> Don't worry, it has a happy ending. Um, here's another great uh, uh, definition of fantasy that I liked. Imaginative fiction featuring especially strange settings and grotesque characters. Grotesque, that's a great five cent word, man. I gotta remember that. So in high school, here's another great photo, look at that. I continued pursuing art. Later in high school, I actually found acceptance and support of being an artsy fartsy person with support from my friends, some teachers, and my family. And um, by the time I had graduated high school, I was really excited to um, start art school, which I went to down in Fort Lauderdale um, at their art institute, which is no more. Um, so I graduated in the early 1990s, as evidenced by this amazing example of 1990s fashion. <laughs> I'm literally wearing a black turtleneck in Florida. <laughs> and a plum jacket. Um, handy. Those are Cavaricci pants. Just for anybody who remembers those, you just can't quite see them. Um, so I graduated, actually, um, the school with honors. And I was so excited to take on the world. I was going to be a, a successful and amazing illustrator. I had this amazing career in editorial illustration. That's right. Magazines were using art of all kinds. And you saw artists like David Cowles, Philip Burke, and Steve Brodner here. And um, this is what ruled the day in the early 1990s. If you were an illustrator, these were the lofty goals you could aspire to. And who could blame us? It was print magazine. They'll be around forever, <laughs> right? They'll use artists like this forever. Eventually, these old dudes will die, and then one of us will get the job, right? So I came out of art school with a portfolio full of my examples of editorial illustration. Not bad, right? Michelle Pfeiffer, Jack Nicholson and the one and only Sir Elton John. I sent them all to every single magazine, and guess what? Yeah, yeah, rejected, no dice. Um, one of the, the secret things that I really had longed for, despite all this, was children's book uh, illustration. It was something that meant so much to me, and so I had been putting together a portfolio of children's book illustration samples. Now, I was told, you really need to be in New York City to do this. You can't really do it from afar. But I, re I was like, no way. I'm going to try. I'll send my stuff out. I'll give it a chance. And guess what? Yeah, rejected. Um, <laughs> It just, you know, it, 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 the samples were anonymous. I was in a slush pie with a zillion other amazing, probably better talented artists that were more suited for the job. And this was also, bear in mind, before there was any internet, no interwebs, or, or it was just starting. And there certainly wasn't organizations like the SCBWI, the Society of Children's Books Writers and Illustrators, to kind of help young artists um, get started. So um, that didn't work out. Um, so guess what? I moved back in with my parents, dejected, very frustrated, and now with the bonus of being in debt with my student loans. Um, over um, meeting with some, I reconnected with some old childhood friends back in my hometown, and we were um, at the bar one night, and we started talking about old times, and we reconnected about this. 
Dungeons and Dragons and how much we all had loved playing Dungeons and Dragons in those bygone days of our middle school youth. In the, you know, it had been almost a decade since D&D had come out and now we were kind of fondly remembering those, those halcyon days of rolling dice and that was the only thing that was important. So I, um, we started a D&D game. Uh, this is actually a um, recreation. This is not, I didn't have a photo of us actually playing back then. These are professional actors recreating <laughs> Tony Dieterlizzi's Dungeons and Dragons game from circa 1991, 92. Um, so we started playing and of course all my friends are like, hey Tony man, you gotta draw my character, you gotta draw my, I don't wanna draw your character, you draw your own character. I'm gonna draw my character and you gotta pencil my friend, you go draw your own character. I don't wanna draw your character. But of course I ended up drawing all their characters. And um, they were like, um, you know, you should send your, your artwork to to TSR, the company that publishes Dungeons and Dragons, and I'm like, ah, I don't know, I don't know. I've, 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 uh, you know, I'm a little weary now. I've, I've submitted to magazines in New York and all the major publishers. I, I think I need to find myself. They're like, no, dude, you need to send your stuff. Your stuff is good enough. And I thought, eh, I don't know. But something about playing Dungeons and Dragons again had rekindled this love of fantasy. I had a sketchbook and I started filling it um, every day. I just started looking back on the, the those old Dungeons and Dragons monsters and how would I draw them now and what would I do differently or is there ways I could, could bring something to the table, draw, interpret them in ways that maybe they hadn't been interpreted before. And so I actually kind of culled some of the better drawings from my sketchbook and put together a submission package. And after several submissions, guess what? Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 Yes, I got hired. It's a much longer story, but I didn't want to draw it all out. But yes, eventually I got hired. And, um, and so over the, throughout the 1990s, I had the amazing opportunity of getting to illustrate for TSR's many Dungeons and Dragons lines, and then later even working for um, Wizards of the Coast and their Magic the Gathering card game, which I'm like, card game, huh? Well, good luck with that. Maybe it'll take off. Um, <laughs> um, so it was... It, it was an amazing opportunity for me. Not only was I getting to illustrate things that seemed to come naturally to me and things that I loved drawing and painting, but it also afforded me uh, to be able to live um, and also be able to move to New York City, which had been a childhood dream of mine, to be able to live in, this, in the, one of the greatest cities next to Flint of all time. And... Um, so, um, and, and so once I was in New York, I was able to start meeting people in publishing, and by the end of the 1990s, I started reaching, uh, for me, incredibly lofty heights in being able to illustrate some of the pinnacle of fantasy illustration, which is the covers to beloved and well-known uh, fantasy authors. But here's the thing. I finished, I remember out of the three of these, the Tolkien, cover was like the, the last one that I did. And I was so stunned and blown away that they had called me to, to illustrate a, a cover for, for Tolkien, somebody who had had such an incredible impact on me. But I, when I went to the bookstore, I was like, do you have a copy of, of Tolkien's Unfinished Tales? And they're like, oh, I think we have a few. And so I looked on the shelf and I saw one illustrated by one author, artist another one with a cover by another artist. There was one that was just typeface. And it occurred to me that though this was a really major success, it was going to be very ephemeral. It was not going to last. I would be here today and gone tomorrow, replaced eventually by someone who was far more interesting, far more talented, far more uh, associated with the next generation of readers. So, in early 2000, at the peak of my illustrating for, for role-playing games and beginning on down a trail of illustrating for fantasy, I walked away from it and finally got a break in the world of children's books. And so I thought, I'm going to start my career all over again. That was a dramatic pause. Um, here's my last um, definition of fantasy that I thought was pretty amazing. The power or process 
of creating especially fanciful mental images in response to a psychological need. I know, go Webster. Oh, I forgot to hit the button so you could read along. Sorry about that. <laughs> this one I definitely like the best. So my first few children's books were picture books. And um, that was good, that was suited me just fine because I was now learning the craft of storytelling both in words and in pictures. I split my time now evenly, spending less time painting and more time learning about plot and character and theme and story. And with each book, I gained a little more of an understanding. I'm still learning and it, it still inspires me and, and, and excites me with each book that I create. Um, my third picture book, The Spider and the Fly, um, won an award, the Caldecott Honor, and, um, oh my God, my computer just died. Did it really? Okay, okay, we'll wing it. Um, won an award, and um, something happened that I never thought would happen. It became a New York Times bestseller um, during a period um, where the, the bestseller for the technical kind of in the weeds, the bestseller list at the time was very simple. It was like children's books, fiction, nonfiction. Now it's broken down to like children's books with bunnies in it that may or may not be fiction, children's books with children that may or may not be also fiction, but, but could be fiction, I, we don't really know, and then, you know, and, uh, ch you know children's books with steam shovels. So it, it, it's very fractured right now, and so it was, it was literally entered a, a best-selling time when it was dominated by, by things like Harry Potter and, and stuff. So, so the publisher um, uh, who published these books was Simon & Schuster Books for Young Readers, and um, my editor at the time, Kevin Lewis, said something to me, and I'll never forget it. He said, if you could write any book, and tell any story, what would it be? And I thought long, long and hard about that. That wasn't something I had a snap judgment on. I, I really had to go away and think about it. And I thought about a moment in time when um, I, had to, I had to read books because school mandated. Like, like, you need to read this book and do a book report by the end of the month. And that's different than I, wanna, I want to read this book. This book isn't being assigned to me, I just want to. I want to read about it. So I um, did. I lose. Did this? Did the screen die? Or did I hit a bunch of buttons? <laughs> can I go forward? I can't go forward. Oh, I can. Well, I mean, I can. I, in my mind, I'm dancing like it's like solid gold. <laughs> But what you will see is Napoleon Dynamite trying to dance on a stage. <laughs> hey, I think we're, um, I think we're dead. Like, I think it's just, it's done. Thank you guys, Flint, you were so fantastic. It was, a, no, I'm kidding. We gotta get, we gotta get to the end. It has a happy ending. Think your power's out. We'll just wait. I'll take questions actually while we're waiting, if you guys want to. Um, I'm totally happy to do that while we buy a little time, find out what happened to the uh, presentation. Um, I don't have power up here, uh, folks, either, for what it's worth. It's saying that the, the power's not working up here, either. Um, anyway, does anyone have any questions while we're waiting for them to see if we can get a technical thing? Yes, right there, waving. Do you still play Dungeons and Dragons? Absolutely, I still play Dungeons and Dragons. Of course I play Dungeons I play with my now 15-year-old daughter and we and my wife, my wife never played before she before we met me. Imagine how that dating went. So you, <laughs> you work for who now? Well, I work for Dungeons and Dragons. That game with the dice, the weird dice. Yeah, that game. And uh, how, how's it looking? It's just gonna be one second. It's, it's gonna be. Something had to reboot. Okay. So All right. So that's okay. Um, so yes, I still do. And and on on top of it, if any of you are older or parents with children. The thing that I tried to do was I ran my daughter through some of the exact same modules that I had played when I was her age so that we could talk about like, you did that in the Caves of Chaos? Well, I did this in the Caves of Chaos. So it's very bonding experience. Hey, we're back, Our, and we're back. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in with us. You're not gonna believe what a man in Florida did. Took a lawn chair, tied a thousand helium balloons to it and got electrocuted. Let's take a look. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what we got here. Yeah, there we go. Dungeons and Dragons, blah, blah, blah. I was feeling sorry for myself. 
And then my friend said, come on, dude, you can do this. Uh, draw our figure. There you go. Draw all our characters. All right, good. And send that off. Keep drawing. You're not good enough. Keep going. Uh-huh. Okay, a little better. All right. Now cut that out. Uh-huh. Paste it on a paste up. This is actually, for anyone going to art school, this was a thing we learned in art school, a, a technique which was I took a module from, from Dungeons and & Dragons and literally taped my art in it and then made a photocopy of that and sent that so that they could see what my art would look like in their actual product. And I was told um, when they hired me that no one had ever done that. And that was something that had been really kind of pounded into my brain in art school. So I, you know, I guess it was worth the nine zillion dollars I paid to learn, you cut it out and you tape it in their book, then you fool them. That's, <laughs> take my money. How, how, how much of a student loan do I need to take out for this? Um, so, yep, worked on that, worked on that. Then we did a little bit of this. Okay. And then, wow, we, we went back in time here. Okay. Then Mr. High and Mighty said, nope, I'm walking away. Um, then fantasy. We're getting there. We're getting. We're almost there. Yep. Especially fanciful grotesque, psychological need, and then I did some kids' books. They were okay. Then this one, slam dunk, and here we go. Kevin Lewis says, "If you could do any book, here we go. We're back. All right." <laughs> so um, I thought really long and hard about this, and I went away for a weekend, and I thought about those books that I had read when I was younger, and how how much they meant to me. And most importantly, I thought about that old field guide I had made when I was 12 going on 13 and, and how much fun I had had making that book and how I had just disappeared into that world. And so I brought some sketches from this to my publisher, to Simon & Schuster, and said, what if we did some kind of field guide to like dragons and, and trolls? And I'm like, but for me, the, 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 the goblins and trolls, they meant different things when I looked at them now. The goblins were like my insecurity and the ogres were like my anger and my frustration and the dragons were like power and, and how I, how I, who, who, who owns the dragons wields the power. And so with another uh, in incredible and aspiring author, uh, Holly Black, we created the Spiderwick Chronicles from, inspired from this notebook I had filled in um, seventh grade, seventh grade, I think I was. So here's the thing with Spiderwick, what it did for me. It was very, um, it, it, it had themes that meant a lot. It, it, the, it, Spiderwick had a big theme about, um, we called it a 21st century uh, kids, a, a fairy tale for 21st century kids because they were dealing with divorce and how a family dealing with divorce, how that affects the various characters. And our protagonist, Jared Grace, was very angry. He was very frustrated. He had, a lot of, um, he had a lot of feelings that he didn't quite know how to deal with. And, and that anger is echoed in other characters like Thimbletack the Brownie who also becomes a boggart when he becomes angry and Mulgarath the Ogre who is, is just untamed anger and vengeful because of the anger. And I liked that a lot. Also, as you saw in these, these uh, recent images, Spiderwick also reflected my love and passion in nature and how I thought there was so much magic in the natural world that it didn't take much to just nudge it just a bit to be a fantastical creature when really what I was doing was trying to do my best John James Audubon as I had done all those years ago. And Spiderwick became incredibly successful um, on the heels of its, um, the book's release. But the thing that I took away the most that, that resonated deep within me was that other readers, other kids felt the same way I did. They needed a fantasy, not just a picture, they needed a story. What does the picture represent? What is the story trying to say? How, how can that help maybe someone else? And so on the heels of Spiderwick, when I began to start my next books, I started thinking about what do I really want to say? What is it that's important? And so I did um, a retelling of Kenneth Graham's Reluctant Dragon in a book called Kenny and the Dragon, and then later in a, a sequel book called Kenny and the Book of Beasts, and that dealt with being a misunderstood monster. 
something I could pull upon very well from my own experience. And the later books dealt with, explored it even more, like what forms um, our think, their thinking of prejudice and how, we, how do characters become misunderstood and what does forgiveness look like? Um, I also explored it in the Wandla trilogy, a science fiction kind of fantasy, Star Wars-y, Studio Ghibli stew that I was, it I, I asked myself a lot of questions about what defines family. Is it really just flesh and blood? Aren't we really all interconnected as one family? Is there, n is there no us and them, only us? These are the questions I started to ask in my stories and I, um, I found it much more satisfying and gratifying to create now fantasy art tied with things that were so honest and, and from the heart. And I did it mostly for this guy, <laughs> but not this guy. For everyone out there who knows exactly what this guy's going through guy, girl, them, they, we've all at some point have felt othered, not part of the group, not part of the team, left out. And I thought, maybe I can make new escape hatches for the next generation that might help them. As an adult and father, I still need an escape hatch from time to time. We all do. Think of how big fantasy shows like Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings have done and continue to do, or the Marvel movies. They're all escape hatches from what seems like such a dark and dreary reality sometimes. But the thing is, a really good fantasy story, for me, has always helped me cope with reality because it's asking questions about our real world. That is what fantasy has done for me. That's why fantasy is so incredibly powerful. It gives me, it reassures my imagination, it validates the way I think, and it gives me hope. Not just for me and my family, but for all of us. That some of these worlds that we see, these utopias, these, these, these acts of kindness, the, the, the friendships, they can leave the pages of a book or a painting and become part of our real world. And that's my talk. Thank you guys so much for having me.